Okay, well, hello and happy International Women's Day celebration. <laughs> My name is Leilani Doctor, and I am the co-president of the Native American Law Students Association here and also a WLA member. Um, it's, on behalf of the WLA, the Women's Law Students Association, and NALSA, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Jody Wilson-Raybould. The minister... Um, she is here today for honoring International Women's Day, and the first thing that I would like to do is thank the minister for coming to Harvard, taking the time to visit us. We are so honored by your presence and grateful for all the work that you've done. We would also like to recognize all of our International Women's Day honorees who are here today in the crowd. Um, first, it's a ge Attorney General Ethel Branch of the Navajo Nation. <laughs> We also have Maura, Maura Berry Grinnells, um, the Skadden partner and co-chair of New York HLS Women's Alliance. We also have Prof Professor Thule Mendicella uh, here, who is the former public protector of South Africa. I believe she's here. Oh, here she is. <laughs> Um, Nancy Perry, Senior Vice President of Government Relations at the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Thank you. And Professor Tashi Rabge and Lo Sang Rabge, who are the co-founders of Machik, a nonprofit focused on developing opportunities in Tibet. So today is about celebrating women who inspire change and inspire us. Each of these honorees has demonstrated grit, diligence, passion, creativity that we all aspire to. And I encourage each of you to reach out to them throughout the day. Rarely do we have such a diverse body of inspiring women in the same room. And it's a really exciting opportunity for all of us to learn from them directly. Today we will hear from Minister Wilson Raybould, who has embodied those values of grit, diligence, passion, and creativity throughout her career. She has built a career as a zealous advocate for First Nations, children, uh, women, the environment, and healthcare services. Um, she's a descendant of the Muscamuk, Sawadnuk, uh, and Lakotak peoples and a member of the Wiwake tribe. I mean, nation. No, sorry, that's an American term. Um, <laughs> And after beginning her legal career as a Crown Prosecutor in Vancouver, she later served as an advisor to the British Columbia Treaty Commission. Um, in 2004, she was elected as the Commissioner to the Chiefs of the First Nations Summit and quickly rose become, to become a Regional Chief of the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations. As a regional chief, she became renowned for her leadership and ability to build coalitions and innovate. She authored the breakthrough BCAFN Governance Toolkit, a guide to nation building, which this toolkit set ambitious goals and actually created the foundation for President, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's um, kind of policy on First Nations. In 2015, Wilson Raybould won her election for the Liberal nomination in Vancouver Granville and was named by Prime Minister Trudeau, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General, becoming the first Indigenous persons in Canada to reach this type of position. <laughs> She has executed this position with precision and compassion, and her work stands as an example of effective leadership for women across the world. We are already stunned by her accomplishments, which have let, left an indelible legacy on Canada, um, and we're so excited for your vision for the future and all the change that it will bring. You're an inspiration to us as young women, and we thank you for all you've done and excited to honor you today. So with that, I welcome Minister Jody Wilson Raybound. Well, thank you for, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, 
Gaelic Hassad, uh, good afternoon. Uh, everyone, bonjour. It is uh, my uh, incredible honor to, to be here at this amazing institution. And uh, without recognizing too many uh, people in, in the room, I do want to acknowledge Canada's uh, uh, Consul General David Alward, who's at the back taking pictures, who uh, uh, <laughs> is uh, an amazing uh, addition to Canada's team, uh, the Consul General for New England. So thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, uh, Ilani, for the, again, for the kind introduction, and uh, to Lindsay and uh, Isabel for inviting me to speak here today uh, on this important uh, event. And I'm really happy that uh, you acknowledge the other honorees that are in the room, and uh, I can tell you without question, I would rather be sitting where you are, listening to your amazing uh, um, stories and, and your own personal experiences, but I'm happy to be here to impart some of my own uh, life experiences and, and pursuits to you. I would like to begin, as I always do in Canada, with acknowledging the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. Uh, on whose lands uh, we're here uh, um, speaking. And again, really pleased to be here at Harvard. This is my first time in Boston and certainly my uh, first time at Harvard and uh, I look forward to, to coming back. But again, really um, pleased to be among uh, the, uh, the honorees and also uh, all the students that are here uh, that are uh, benefiting from uh, the amazing uh, learnings and teachings in this amazing institution. So from someone who comes from a long line of strong women uh, who have immensely influenced my life, I'm grateful for the opportunity to celebrate women and girls on this, the start of uh, a celebration of International Women's Day. And I have, as been briefly described um, throughout my life, uh, been a strong advocate for uh, diversity, inclusion, equality, and human rights. And of course, I know we all believe that uh, women's rights are human rights. And this is something that our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, understands well, as evidenced in his commitment to gender equality in our government through initiatives uh, uh, in the federal budget that support uh, wage parity and promoting feminism internationally. Today I would like to share a few words with you about my own experiences, uh, my own um, upbringing as an Indigenous person, and uh, my teachings uh, from my parents and grandparents, and some comments around um, the concept of balance. And so first, as is uh, always the custom in my uh, traditions, is to introduce myself. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Jody Wilson-Raybould. My traditional name is Puglas, and I come from, and the pronunciation was amazing, I come from the Muskema, Dawadanik, and Lekwikta people of northern Vancouver Island, which is just off the west coast uh, of British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I'm part of the Kwakwakiwak, the Kwakwala-speaking people. We are a matrilineal society. Matrilineal society means that descent is, and property is inherited through the female line. We have hereditary chiefs, always men, who are groomed from the time they are born for leadership, but they are groomed by women. My father is the hereditary chief of our clan, the Eagle Clan. His name is Himas Klalilikla, which translated means uh, number one amongst the eagle, the chief that's always there to help. He was given his name in a potlatch, which is our traditional form of government, one of which we still practice today. It is here where our names are passed down from generation to generation. It is where our laws are made, disputes settled, people married, and where wealth is redistributed. In our potlatch, the highest ranking name, uh, or the highest ranking male leaders are called Hamatsa. Rank is reflected in positions and names, which bring them considerable responsibility and obligations. My grandmother's name was Pugladi, the highest ranking name, male or female, in our clan. Her name means a good host, and my name, Pugles, means a woman born to noble people. My grandmother ensured that my sister and I knew our culture, our values, the laws of our big house, and how to conduct oneself as a leader. 
we are a potlatching people. In our system, I am haligilasti, a role that's always held by women. One of the jobs, one of my jobs, is to lead the hamatsa, the chief, into the big house. The haligilasti can be translated um, as one who corrects the chief's path. We show them the way, a metaphor for life, and in our potlatch ceremony, the power of the hamatsa is symbolically tamed, and he becomes ready for chief. In the big house, there are no political parties, thank goodness. Um, rather, we govern by way of consensus, and where the roles of leaders is to seek that consensus. We meet, and while not everyone may agree with every aspect, we debate issues and seek general agreement to help ensure decisions are balanced, supported, and will be enduring to stand the test of time. My grandmother used to joke, and this is appropriate for International Women's uh, uh, Week and Month, um, when it came to the respective roles of men and women in our society, women were simply too busy and too important to be chiefs. <laughs> and while I'm sort of kidding, everybody in our society has a role to play to ensure that the community functions properly, functions well. The roles are different but equally important in ensuring that society functions the way that it should. Our system emphasized balance between men and women, between clans, and between tribes. A society that does not treat men and women with the same respect will never meet its full potential. In my nation's world, I do not think we would have survived without it. In many ways, my role as Haligalasti has carried over to all other aspects of my life. My upbringing, my education, my professional and personal experiences have all helped shape my worldview. Before running for political office, as was mentioned, I attended law school and worked as a crown attorney, a government prosecutor, in one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in Canada before turning my attention to Indigenous rights. Then, for close to six years, I served as regional chief for the Assembly of First Nations for British Columbia, a position that was elected by the 203 chiefs of British Columbia. In this capacity, I advocated for changes in laws and government policy to support reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and to rebuild Indigenous nations within Canada. It was not my intention to run for federal office, but it be I became convinced of the need um, um, for our people to get involved in government and to encourage governments to take the necessary steps to, to advance a more inclusive society, one that respects our country's diversity and in particular, the place of indigenous peoples. And as I've said elsewhere, while my appointment as Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada was certainly a personal accomplishment for me, I view it more as a reflection on, not as a reflection on me personally, but more as a symbol of how Canada is changing. In the Canada of my grandmother and my father, the Canada they were born into, Indigenous peoples did not have the right to vote, let alone run for office or practice as lawyers. In my own nation, the potlatch, as I said, our traditional form of governance, was banned by law and our ceremonial masks and regalia confiscated. As a person against whom the laws of Canada have discriminated and to a certain degree still discriminate, and one that fought for years against those laws, it is remarkable to think that now I'm the principal lawyer in charge of administering those laws and am responsible for advising the government. We are making changes. One of the most invigorating aspects of being a lawyer, an activist, and now MoJag, as I like to call it, has been working to correct what I see as the imbalance in Canadian society. I believe in finding balances between the diversity of views, balance between competing rights of individuals in a democracy, including those of women, indigenous peoples, and other minorities. 
What I learned from my community growing up is that when people are prevented, as I said, from playing their role or having their say, the entire community, the entire country suffers. As the minister responsible for federal law, I have had the opportunity to work to correct that imbalance and to make sure that all voices are considered in policy decisions. It is also my responsibility to ensure that all proposed legislation is consistent with our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter is the primary expression of our respect for diversity and the unity that is Canada. It too involves a balancing of rights that sometimes compete with one another. With the Charter in mind, Canadians have been examining some incredibly complex and sensitive issues over the last number of years. These include some issues that many US states and European countries have already grappled with, such as medical assistance in dying and the legalization of marijuana. But in my view, one of the most urgent and compelling matters facing Canadians today, and one I believe will be the lasting legacy of our government, is finding a way to overcome the long and often tragic history between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in our country, which has had particularly debilitating effects on Indigenous women and girls. This process of true reconciliation with Indigenous peoples means confronting and ending the legacy of colonialism in Canada and replacing it with a future built on Indigenous self-determination, including self-government. I personally am so proud to be in a position and working within a government to ensure this important and transformational change takes place. Our government has committed to building a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples based on the recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. Our goal is to build greater trust and help lay the foundation for lasting and real change where social and economic exclusion and uncertainty is replaced with prosperity and opportunity for all. Better opportunities for Indigenous peoples and particularly Indigenous women and girls are precisely what we hoped to achieve through this approach. To this end, and I don't know if anybody saw this, I was incredibly proud to witness and sit in on the floor of the House of Commons and witness our Prime Minister deliver an historic speech uh, in Parliament last month when he confirmed Indigenous people's fundamental place within our constitutional framework, that is Section 35, which recognizes Aboriginal and treaty, treaty rights, and the Prime Minister confirming Section 35 is a full box of rights, and committed our government to moving forward in all our relations with Indigenous peoples based on the recognition of those rights, embracing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, embracing their minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous peoples, and creating the space within our robust constitutional framework for Indigenous self-determination and self-government through a principled approach and through moving forward with major legislative and policy shifts in our government. Of course, this cannot be achieved without addressing the gaps that exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, starting with the heartbreaking disparities in rates of vulnerability to crime, particularly Indigenous women and girls. Often due to misconception and bias, we do not easily admit that Indigenous peoples are far too often to be victims of crime. The stark reality is that Indigenous women experience violence and sexual assault at a rate almost three times that of non-Indigenous women and report more severe forms of violence. There are over 1,500 unsolved cases of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in Canada. As Minister of Justice, I was one of the ministers responsible for launching an independent national inquiry into this tragedy to get at the root causes of why this situation exists in the first place. The inquiry, which is ongoing, is critical to renewing a sense of trust between government and Indigenous peoples across Canada. And moving from being, a vic being victims of crime, 
when we take a look at the issue of women in custody across Canada, Indigenous women account for 49% of all admissions to provincial and territorial correctional facilities and 36% of women in federal prisons. This means that more than one in three women federally incarcerated are Indigenous. The overrepresentation of Indigenous women within our justice system is indicative of the systemic problems that require comprehensive reforms, reforms that we are actively moving forward with and will implement, from reforming administration of justice offences, bail reform, to looking at changes in sentencing and embracing, in a real way, restorative justice. With this present context in mind, I will turn briefly to a discussion of the experiences of Indigenous women during the colonial power struggle and their role in the current process of transformation. While Indigenous women historically may have had different political and social roles in their respective societies, they all share a common colonial experience. For Indigenous women in Canada, the colonial experience, as I said, was particularly harsh. The Indian Act was a colonial piece of legislation that government enacted to govern and define the relationship between First Nations and Canada. It imposed a system that divided 80-plus tribes or Indigenous nations into 630-plus administrative units called bands. It established reserves and set out how the bands would be governed, as well as who was legally an Indian and how this Indian status was passed on. The system was designed to ultimately enfranchise and assimilate Indians. The Indian Act turned Indigenous um, social and political systems on their head, often shifting the balance of power between men and women. For example, the system did not acknowledge matrilineal heritage. Further, by eradicating hereditary leadership structures, the Act abolished the central role of women in many of our tribes in raising, teaching, and guiding and regulating chiefs. And in those cases where women had been hereditary chiefs, there were some, under the Indian Act, only men could run and vote for chief and council. To make matters worse, if a woman married a man who was not registered as an Indian, she lost her status as an Indian and her right to be a member in the band. Legally, she was cast out. Conversely, a non-Indian man who married an a non-Indian woman who married an Indian man became a legal Indian. So in some ways, the Indian Act, of course, suppressed women um, who were traditionally the decision makers in their societies. In fact, Indigenous women did not get the right to run for chief and to vote in banned elections until 1951, more than 80 years after Canada became a country. For more than a century under the Indian Act, successive Canadian governments followed this policy of Indigenous assimilation. One of the most pernicious tools of that policy was the residential school system, whose stated mandate was to remove the Indian from the child. Over a span of seven generation, generations, Canada removed thousands of children from their families and communities and placed them in schools in unfamiliar places with often hostile and abusive environments. And children were deprived of their language and their culture. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologized for these schools in 2008 and followed following the apology, struck a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which was established to hear and record the stories of survivors. Murray Sinclair, who chaired the commission, described the residential school policy as cultural genocide. The commission made 94 recommendations, and for those um, that are directed at the federal government, we have committed to act on all of them. Yet despite this history, Despite this tragedy, what is so powerful today and so very encouraging, and it gives me great optimism, is the demonstrated resilience of First Nations women
First Nations generally, but First Nations women and the integral role they are playing in the transition during this period of governance reform, this transformative period of Indigenous nation rebuilding. I think of the hundreds of women living in First Nations communities, living and working on reserve, who are leading fundamental community development work, the work that needs to take place in order to move through what I like to call the post-colonial door. Women are truly driving the needed governance reform to get beyond Indian Act structures, something that be became very clear to me when I was regional chief. Women are involved in building their institutions of good governance, developing land codes, election codes, constitutions, and so on. It is women who show up to community meetings, working groups, and roll up their sleeves to develop inclusive policy moving forward. They are the forces of real change, of decolonization. When I was elected regional chief of British Columbia, I was the only executive member of an executive of 11 who was a woman. There are two women now on the national executive. There's never been a woman, a female national chief, as the head of the Assembly of First Nations, although women have run. I think the time has come. So while Indigenous women are making progress politically, we can do better whether within the confines of the institutions we are transitioning away from or those that we are evolving to replace them. As we all know, or all are well aware of, gender disparities are certainly not unique to Indigenous women. Within our democratic institutions, generally in Canada, there is a need for more women in politics and in the boardrooms of our nations. Women and girls from all walks of life continue to face injustices and discrimination in Canada and around the world. While women have certainly made great strides in many areas, such as education and workforce participation, significant inequalities still persist. Many women and girls still limit themselves to the expectations of others. They will come to doubt, or they come to doubt their value their strength, and their ability to contribute to their communities. And to quote a poet, a Canadian poet, Rupi Kerr, she said, what's the greatest lesson a woman should learn? That since day one, she's already had everything she needs within herself. It's the world that convinced her she did not. The product of this doubt one that I truly believe is socially constructed, is reflected in the lower rates of pay, the underrepresentation in politics and corporate positions of power and influence. As both a woman and an Indigenous person, where our rights to participate in our systems of government were denied for so many years, I, create, I place great value on citizen engagement and broad participation in our political processes. Yet in Canada, only 26% of elected members of parliament are women, only slightly higher than the international average of 24%. When women and minorities participate at equal levels, they bring differing perspectives and approaches to addressing issues. In this regard, problems may be better examined and decisions more balanced, which in turn contributes to strong communities and strong economies. Well-informed, inclusive policy increases a society's chances of meeting the needs of its people and sustaining long-term economic development, which benefits all. This is the fundamental tenet upon which decision-making is based in my community, the Big House. I fervent, fervently believe that greater participation by women and minorities is also key to addressing our global culture of gender-based violence. Over the past few months, we have seen women around the world speaking up against practices that demean and discriminate against them. The high pro profile cases of Me Too, of the Me Too movement, have highlighted the many ways that sexual harassment and assault cross workplace and social and economic barriers and have devastating consequences for victims and survivors, their families, and communities. 
as we find ourselves perhaps in a societal turning point, we can and must do more to create hopeful futures for women. Fortunately, there seems to be a growing movement towards change. And that change must begin by recognizing that the gender stereotypes and subtle sexism we encounter every day is fundamentally part of the problem. But I do not think it is enough that women uh, demand fair treatment. We must also ensure that our institutions are designed from the ground up to support women's equality. I am grateful to find myself in a government that has made advancing gender equality a flagship policy, both at home and abroad. Indeed, at present, we have the opportunity to further promote gender equality as part of Canada's progressive trade agenda, including NAFTA renegotiations. We are all more prosperous when women are fully and fairly participating in North American commerce. At a fundamental level, I am fortunate to serve with like-minded colleagues who are committed to upholding gender equality in all sectors of Canada and Canadian society. I'm honored to be part of a gender-balanced cabinet um, under the leadership of Prime Minister Trudeau. And in our government's most recent budget released last week, we invested an unprecedented level of funding for initiatives that promote greater inclusion of women and girls, whether it be in science and technology or in sports. Our investments in enhanced paternity leave reflect the reality that equality in the workplace requires greater equality at home. Further, the Government of Canada recognizes that women's rights include sexual and reproductive rights. These rights are at the core of our foreign and domestic policies. We also believe that everyone should have the right to live according to their gender identity and express their gender as they choose, free from discrimination. Last year, I was proud, we were proud to pass legislation that adds gender expression and identity as a protected ground under human rights legislation and in our criminal code provisions dealing with hate propaganda, incitement of genocide, and aggravating sentences, sent, or aggravating factors in sentencing. So in closing, ensuring the participation of women is of course only one dimension of social diversity. Inclusiveness is a fundamental tenet or key value of democratic polities so that all voices have a role in decision making, whether defined by gender, ethnicity, religion, economic status, age, sexual orientation, or education. And let me end with some personal reflections on International Women's Day. This day is not only an occasion to recognize the amazing achievements of women and girls, but it is an also a reminder that not so long ago, women in Canada and the United States were still fighting to achieve some of our most basic rights. The right to enter into legal agreements, the right to buy property, the right to vote, and the right to equal pay. For Indigenous women in Canada, these rights came even later. And in many ways, we are still catching up as we deconstruct the colonial legacy. For many years, I worked alongside amazing Indigenous leaders who fought for changes to Canada's laws and policies regarding Indigenous peoples, men and women. And now it is my immense pleasure and privilege to do so as well as the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Without the efforts of so many who came before us, I certainly would not be standing here today. So thank you for letting me say a few words, and thanks to each of you for the incredible role that you play, doing your part in your own spheres of influence, whatever they may be, in creating a more just, a more inclusive, and a more compassionate society. Through strong women like you, we will strengthen our respective communities. And each of us, in our own way, is a haligalasti. We each have an important role to play in guiding a path forward and helping our societies find balance and flourish. 
So in recognition of International Women's Day, I invite all of you to join me to continue to work towards true gender equality in our respective countries and around the world. Together we can correct the imbalance. Together we can amplify the voices of all. And together we can transform the world. Gaelic Hasla, thank you very much. We can chat informally about that. We'll be running for prime minister. I am incredibly proud to be Mojag under a prime minister who has really paved the way for transformation. Um, our prime minister is uh, incredibly uh, open and ensures that all of our all the ministers and all members of parliament have the ability to fulfill their roles and do their job well so um, i'm happy that he's there um as uh, i've never been busier in my entire life than in this position and i've always been a really busy person attorney general of the navajo nation um uh, and i i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't trade it for the world but uh I'm happy where I am. <laughs> How many people have been to Canada? How many people have been to Vancouver? Ah, oh, amazing. How many people are studying in this amazing uh, institution? Future attorney generals, maybe? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks.